see the path to the championship. I can see it. Coca-Cola 600 belongs to Ryan Blaney. Blaney's learned how to win over the last couple of months. Blaney! Harvin! It's been behind him! It's going to be Blaney! We're going to win this thing. Ryan Blaney is going to win his way into the championship board. You have to run a perfect race to, to get it. Ryan Blaney is a NASCAR Cup Series champion! What an unbelievable year. What an unbelievable playoffs for us. This is the Team Blaney Podcast. Welcome everyone to episode 138 of the Team Blaney Podcast. My name is Adam Rogers and alongside me is co-host Steve Mez. This podcast is brought to you by Fans for Fans. Steve and I have been following the drivers of the Blaney Racing family for two decades and Team Blaney itself launched on social media back in 2014. Each weekly episode of the show offers an in-depth analysis of Ryan Blaney's latest NASCAR Cup Series race, plus news notes and a lineup of special guest interviews all throughout the year. This week, we break down Team 12's run in the Cookout 400 at Martinsville Speedway. Steve, welcome back. Episode 138. And I know we both just got off the road after traveling back our separate ways from Martinsville, Virginia. Um, But I think we're a little bit refreshed. We both uh, had some meals at Cookout on our travels uh, uh, to to and from the track. So I, I think we're... You know, we're well nourished uh, by the, the sponsor of the race. And uh, we got to take in a lot of action over the weekend and uh, meet up with some great friends again. And um, I don't know, all around uh, with the way the race ended up playing out and uh, the weather and everything. I, it was a pretty good weekend of racing. Um, maybe lacked a little bit of excitement, but we'll get into that at some point during this episode. Yeah. No, good good weekend for us. Um, we rushed home to do the podcast just yes. like Denny Hamlin does. The only difference is Denny takes a helicopter and we actually had to drive home. So it's going to take a little longer for us to get our podcast out than Denny. But uh, yeah, though the weekend overall, the experience was, uh, was, you know, Martinsville is actually a really good experience. Um, Their Wi-Fi, I'm going to comment on that. Um, Yes. They've got, I tell you what, was extremely good. And then I realized where we were sitting, the row right below us on the, on the aisle underneath the seat was one of the boxes. So we were right next to a Wi-Fi port, but um, uh, the only every once in a great while I couldn't get a picture out. But for the most part, you and I actually were able to text each other um, yeah. during the race from across the track, and uh, be able to get onto social media, um, pull up the NASCAR app, actually look at timing and scoring. Uh, you know, it's always a little bit behind because of satellites and because sure. short track uh, stuff's mine. But just the same, I could see lap times and so forth during some of these long runs when there wasn't really much to watch. Um, and see if anybody was actually kind of gaining or not. Um, so, yeah, the, the overall experience of Martinsville itself, uh, extremely good. Uh, the hot dogs, uh, you know, um, I think between between the wife and I, I uh, ended up being with six of them. So, uh, you know, not too bad. We, we, yeah. we didn't, once the race started, we weren't going to go down to the hot dog stand. So that was the thing. If, if we would have went down there once or twice more, I'm sure we could have got a couple more in. But um, we had, uh, you know, beforehand, um, you know, we got to meet meet up with you guys and uh, and Justin and and Chelsea. That uh, they were there for um, getting some it was pre pre uh, pre race autographs, stuff like that. You know, and then you and uh, Tara. Have you, you on the podcast? You actually haven't told the Tara story yet, have you? Um, I mean, maybe I can't remember the Atlanta the Atlanta win review possibly yeah. mentioned it a little bit, but yeah, she kind of had a. If it, just to recap, my wife. Um, we're at Atlanta. Obviously, the race comes down to Daniel Suarez, Kyle Busch, and our guy Ryan Blaney. Um, Ryan just gets beat by Suarez. My wife has been a huge Suarez fan since the very first race I took to uh, took her to, which was a Do- Daytona uh, July race several years ago. Um, he was the first driver she met, and she immediately picked him. Even though I tried to convince her, like, why don't you know you should just be a Blaney fan? But hey, that didn't work out. <laughs> um, but you know, we've been to uh, lots of uh, autograph sessions and like real quick meetings with him over the years. Um, but she, he wins the race, which we could tell you. I mean, it's, well, maybe Steve. Steve's been to a lot of Blaney wins, but it is <laughs> quite rare for you to see your favorite driver win when you're in person. Yeah. Because you know, I mean, we go probably to more cup races than most people would so maybe our stats are our odds are a little bit better but so she finally gets to see her favorite driver win in person it brought her to tears and um i took a photo of it and she did not really appreciate the photo but i had posted it on my own social media 
and you know people were like really liking it so she made her own post on x and track house picked it up and some of the the sponsors of the car and um some of their other social media people and it like the whole ride home uh from atlanta back down into florida like her phone was blowing up and the post went you know viral on basically nascar twitter um the daily downforce followed up like a week later and did like a feature story about her and, you know, kind of her whole life and how she became a fan and um, track house reached out to us and said, Hey, we want to set up like a special meet and greet. And um, they asked which the next race we were going to, it was Martinsville. And um, they, they came through um, kudos to Jason Schultz. Uh, you might remember that name from being a uh, producer on door bumper clear, uh, but he's now um, one of the, the main social media guys at track house racing. And uh, he set the whole thing up for us, took us down to meet Daniel before the driver's meeting. And um, if you follow track house, social media, they have videos of it up. Um, you might see a glimpse of me real fast, but I'm definitely not the star of the show. My wife is so um, amazing experience. I mean, it's just one of those things you almost only can, can experience in NASCAR. I think. Yeah. The, uh, the, the the original photo that you took when you took what and I don't want to speak for your wife but what people don't realize is how much she's into it and has followed him for so long and he is such a genuinely good person and has actually you know talked to her noticed her recognized her before you know in person and those emotions were raw true emotions of somebody who's been rooting for him forever and just got a chance to see that, that, that moment, you know? And so everything to go on with that was, was super. And then the meeting, the meeting yesterday was even better because, you know, he, he, you know, Jay, I guess Jason was there too. Correct. He was standing yes, there with, yep. you know, cause he, cause he, you know, if you see the video, he, you know, he says something to him first, like, Oh, I know her. He says right away. <laughs> and it's just so great. He's just so, he is genuinely just one of the best people that I, I've ever seen interact with, with his fans, you know, he, you know, he just, he's a good person. And, 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 and I, I totally understand why your roof, wife roots for him. Um, and it was, it was really, really nice thing to see. Yeah. That was he, and he tells the story on the video. If you look it up again on, on track house, social media, where he says like, I saw the, you know, he saw the post, he saw the photo, didn't realize it was her. And he says like, he's like, because, every time we meet her, she's always smiling. She's always happy. It didn't look like it. So um, that was really cool. It's tough. Um, you know, Daniel is a great guy. Um, always been very cordial anytime we've met him before, but he has like that Joey Logano mentality that I'll say when Daniel puts his helmet on, um, I don't necessarily want Ryan racing around him because uh, much <laughs> like his teammate too, Ross Chastain, you know, they are, they're very selfish drivers, which a lot of cup drivers have to be to be successful. So um yeah friends off the track i don't know about friends <laughs> on the track though uh but kudos to him hey he's got a win and he's already locked into the playoffs so um i know ryan's got got a little bit of work to do to get that far this year but hey reigning cup champion what can you ask for mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah that sets up our, our weekend at martinsville second trip there i did have uh six hot dogs on the hot dog count um but i don't think i could do any more than that <laughs> and um <laughs> like i said cook out on the way home um one real quick i don't want to keep talking too long but wi-fi and why it might be better is the nascar tracks nascar owned tracks have a deal with verizon that has set up their infrastructure for wi-fi basically every nascar owned track that i've been to the wi-fi has been above and beyond better than any of the smi tracks that claim that their fans first wi-fi is amazing and it is if you're standing right underneath you know one of those little uh, repeaters, but uh, I can tell you from Atlanta and some, several other places, it's not really that it's that great. But kudos to uh, NASCAR and whatever they're doing because I think that's the future. They were advertising this year about you know having radio or scanner access on your phones, and if you're going to have that, you need to have great cell signal or great Wi-Fi signal. Um, just just to reiterate, um, where we were sitting, we were sitting almost at the end of turn two, or at the end of pit road there. And like I said, there was a box in the stands there. Now, I don't know how many of them are in my section. Maybe it's only one per section or whatever, but I'm not even sitting in the main grandstands, you know, over there. I'm all the way on the other side of the track, and they had it set up over there. So, yeah, yeah, that, that's pretty good coverage. It's, yeah, it's something NASCAR needs to do. That's what NFL stadiums 
base major league baseball stadiums m you know mls stadiums like that's that's the future um it used to be enough to just put on a race and have people be entertained by that but now they want you know even us you know we want to communicate even when we're mm-hmm. both not at the track together mm-hmm. uh, we want to send photos out on social media and that does great brand building for the sport itself too so um that's the future i think it's only going to get better from here but yeah kudos to whoever is setting that up at most of the nascar owned facilities so um truck race caution i think most of it was under caution the xfinity series race um they had it had its issues <laughs> too and um sheldon creed sent it on the last restart and kind of jumbled that up a little bit um but we're here to talk about the cup series race and uh everything gets started in practice and qualifying at this the shortest track in nascar yeah thanks fox sport 2 for the great coverage I warned you. I warned you. I know. I know. I, it, it, <laughs> the worst part is, is I have regular Fox Sport, okay? And sometimes when they put it on Fox Sport 2 because they have to, because something happened or whatnot or something ran long, then you can go to the app and it'll let you watch it from the app. But this was not one of those occasions. And uh, we actually, the, the wife actually pulled up on her phone. They give you a free view for a certain amount of time. So we got to watch some of it. Um, you know, Group A, um, they're going out in group A and Tim's um, got them running about 30 laps. And if it's any good, you know, they can stay out. Um, <clears throat> the two of the 21 were in that group also. And 10 laps in, uh, about P9, but if it's a 0.126 back of the seven car of all cars who ran, ran a good lap. And here's the, the worst part about practice and this single lap situation that, that they get the timing. Martinsville especially, um, even though they're split in half, to you know 18 19 cars um within a session they don't all get out on the track and and just run they all kind of have to stagger their way out there make sure they all get out off a of pit road and then they start circling so like the first lap or two sometimes there's nothing but just waiting yeah. till everybody gets up to speed and then from there it just kind of depends on how close or far behind you are somebody because if you're too close to somebody you back off sometimes going into the corner. So the early lap thing, you can't yeah. really take that. And they, and they do such a uh, oh, horrible job of TV, always talking and showing that. You know, it's like, here they are. Look how fast the seven car is. He was fast for one lap. Let's look at a 20 lap average and a 30 lap average, you know, and <laughs> that's what we do, you know. Yeah, we were there for practice, and I will say it's it's a little chaotic at a short track. And Ryan, I think he came out behind the 48, and like he was trying to make a gap, but then the guys are coming up behind him, and it just gets a little bit, like I said, chaotic. And you could tell, and that's why, honestly, I mean, a lot of guys didn't set their fastest lap until you know four or five laps into the run. And um, yeah, the the ones that did have a clear shot right out of the gate did have some of the fastest laps and i'll bring up last week bubba pollard in a different series but bubba pollard in the xfinity series was the first car out on track in their practice had the fastest lap all weekend and that's all everybody could talk about but you know in his interviews later on after the race he said you know like we were terrible in practice (laughs) so Mm -hmm. yeah but you're right tv though that's all they talked about man look how fast this guy yeah as they go later into practice then they show you these averages and it's like well that's what we need to see um you know, five minutes in, Tim says they're going in the right direction. Twelve minutes in, Jonathan tells him it's his call if he wants to work on it or not. You know, come in now if you're going to work on it. Ryan brings it in. They ran 33 laps there. And at that point, it was like the fourth best 30-lap average. So there we go. Okay, that's a little more what we want to know about. Um, behind the 48, the 24, and the 23. So now we know some of the players, you know, in the, in the group A who, who you know, were good at the 30-lap average. Um, with five minutes to go, they come back out. Tim says they run a really good lap there. Um, you know, Tim says something about they were a little loose there. Uh, it was the fifth overall lap um, average, overall lap average. So if you take both times he went out, fifth best overall average in that session. They ran 46 laps. Once again, here are the fast five, the seven, the 23, the 41, the 48, and the 19. But like I said, the 30-lap average, the 23 and the 48 were in there, but those other cars weren't in there, so... You can take that single lap for what it is, you know. Group B, of course, is a little slower than Group A because they, you know, they rubbered up the track a little bit. Um, the fast five there ended up being the nine, the fifty-four, the five, the eleven, the forty-five. You know, 
So um, there's one or two cars that move ahead of Ryan in the 30 up average. So that tells you something too. Slower in the second session, but like the five, the 11, and the 34 move up into 30 lap average. So that tells you how good they were on long runs. Um, so, and Larson was the was the fastest force of that, and he was like a 20.335. Once again, you know, he's always seems to be a car to beat there with average long lap, uh, long runs. Uh, we get to qualifying group A. Ryan goes out 11th. Um, four guys. Um, and Ryan comes on the radio and asks Tim about uh, what the track is doing so far. Uh, ten, 10 cars in, the two car is top of the board. You know, pretty impressive there for him. Um, Ryan runs a 19.913, which is P2 at that point. Uh, and Tim tells him the 23 wasn't a pretty lap, um, but it was fast. So, you know the way the way the twenty three went in and out of the corners wasn't was a little bit scary, but uh, he he held on to it. So, uh, but they do get to the end of the session there, and I think it was like one car to go, and Ryan was like on teetering on whether or not he was going to make, it, and he made it. So the uh, twenty three, the fourteen, the forty eight, the nineteen, and the twelve are going to run for the pole from Group A. Um, group B was going to be the five, the nine, the eleven, the four, and the twenty two. Yeah, I thought for sure. I think even said our Discord chat, I was like, I was like, not a bad lap, but there's no way we make the top five. And then just one after another, like I think Christopher Bell, like some other guys just had some really bad laps. And I was like, yeah, wow, laps. okay. Well, I guess we'll yeah. make it in. And then always great to have a guaranteed top ten finish. Top ten. Yeah. Or top, top ten, 10 start. start. Yeah. Almost a guaranteed um, top ten finish when he goes to Martinsville, though, in general. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he 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 does his pole run. He went out first, of course, of all the cars because he was the fifth guy in the in group A. Um, ends up being ninth, P P nine overall, and the five car wins uh, wins the pole. Um, so he beat at least one car from the the previous um, <clears throat> previous qualifying. But uh, you know, P nine is like I said, pretty good. I always like it because it's inside lane um, here on, especially at Martinsville. Uh, so we get to Sunday, we got stages of 80, 180, and then 400, nine sets of tires. Pit stall 41, the last one, uh, all the way at the beginning of pit road uh, with the 16 in front of them. And I think there is a video from Saturday press conference even where Ryan talks about the advantages of, of having that pit stall. Um, so, you know, the, the, they've done this a couple times uh, at Martinsville's particular last year i think that was their pit stall when they won the race so you don't always need to have the number one pit stall to win uh to win at martinsville um by um starting the race here by lap two he's up to eighth here and i once again we're at the track so i'm not gonna have like who he passed here but i'm gonna at least be able to give you some of the movement um by lap <laughs> and this is how this is how <laughs> it just gets spread out and one by one, by lap 39, from lap 39 to 42, he passed, uh, gets passed a couple of times. And he goes back to about 12. And uh, we get to the end of the stage, because that's it. He runs 12th from there to the end of the stage. Uh, the five wins the stage, Ryan's 12th. Um, now, the first pit stop here, uh, it's listed as a 10.87. Now, somebody on, uh, on X asked the question, why this and why that? Well, this week, this is what happens. That's something with the rear rear tire. The right rear or the left rear? I'm not sure. I believe left rear. Left rear. Okay. Um, it was just a little loose. Yep. On the on the yeah, and it, it, I mean it's an immediate thing because I can hear on the scanner Jonathan says something and they just go basically come back around and make sure it's tight. Uh, the stop itself was like a, a 10.87, so they probably wouldn't have lost any ground on the stop. Um, it's just one of those things. You know, maybe the jack gets dropped a little early and he, or he just didn't have a good, uh, you know, thing on the button. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if, I don't know if skip will talk about it on, on, on stacking pennies this week or not. They, sometimes he will cover this stuff. Sometimes he won't, but it does change the race totally for Ryan because now instead of in that top 10 to 12, um, he's going to be tail end the longest line on the lead lap because he pits a second time to fix the, the the wheel, make sure it's on tight. And when you do this, pitting twice, you have to go tail end. Um, bad part about this is the the green flag run at the beginning of the race puts some cars a lap down. So then you got those cars in between you and a position that you're going to actually be racing for. So um, if there was any positive out of this bad situation, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's that they caught it. Um, yeah. You're going to see the 20 car at, at a point here 
you know, the, the tire didn't, wasn't necessarily loose. They didn't seat well. And, and Skip will talk about the pins and how the pin has to activate and everything for it to, for it to stay on. So, you know, that happens to the 20 at some point during the race and he loses multiple laps. Um, one, because NASCAR, we might talk about it. NASCAR doesn't actually throw a caution for him and he has to come about, come down pit road and do it. So um, I, I will say well, the positive that- is that, is that they caught it. And it was yeah. under a caution. It was under, you know, it wasn't under yeah. live racing or we would have been a much, much, much more trouble. The only Keep other thing home. I wanted to mention was um, I think in, in the post you're talking about on X, you know, had had asked or and I saw I saw this somewhere else, too, might have been discord where, you know, like, why were they so bad firing off? And I'm like, I mean, really, he, he only went from like he I think he got up to eighth. And then mm-hmm. fell back to 12th. And honestly, I was nervous because when he made that drop from 8th to 12th, it was pretty rapid. But then he just basically got to 12th and then it was like he was at the speed of everybody behind him. So like he just held that all the way to the end of the stage. So I wasn't too concerned. I feel like if we could have gone forward from there, I mean, I don't know if we finish higher than than they than they do, but um, it would have been it wouldn't have been as much of a fight, I guess, the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. Well, here's here's a. Uh something that goes along with that Ryan in the post race mentions what happened about having to pit again. Doesn't. And, and, and he says they had tightened up the car to begin with, but then now all of a sudden now they're back in the dirty air and it makes it even tighter. So from this point forward till the next set of pit stops, they're really, really battling hard over the condition because they made an adjustment based on where they were or where they were going to be. And then they end up in the back and that makes it a little worse. Um, something really interesting on this set of pit stops is the 22, the 54, and the 11, or no, I'm sorry, the 17. 22, the 54, and the 17 all decide to take two tires. And um, it works. this works out for at least one guy. Um, I don't know about the other two. It really doesn't change their position. I mean, they move up in position, but I don't think it really helps them. But by doing this, we discover that we're going to be able to do something later on. Um, P24 for the restart. Uh, on lap 93 here by um, lap 99, he gets it through a couple of these lap cars, gets to 23rd. And okay, so now lap 114 is the debris caution. And this goes back to the 20 car. So what happened is he lost the lug nut. The wheel didn't come flying off the car. It got stuck up in the wheel well. Yeah. According, yeah, according to what I read. Sideways, yeah. It got, you know, so what we saw, we thought it was a flat tire from where we were sitting because he hit pit road. And there was no caution until they saw the lug nut out there. That was the debris caution from what I understand. At least that's what what I read. Um, So they do come in and pit now. And what's great about this is now the lap cars won't be in between them either. Um, But they go ahead and put on fresh rubber here. And um, they do a 10.64. I think they lose one position. I think they go from 23rd to 24th here. Uh, they restart lap 114, and like I said, there's now there's no lappers in between him. So now he's racing positions in front of him. Uh, by lap one, from lap 125 to 127, he gets up to 21st. At lap 134, he's 20th, and he's in 20th all the way to the end of the stage. <laughs> so the uh, stage two is won by the 11 car. The 22 led a bunch of laps by doing that, and then I think he only lost a position or two. Uh, the rest of that run. So the two car tire move looks to be a pretty good move at this point. So we talk, we're going to talk about whether the race was exciting or not. And I will say there's excitement in short spurts. And this was one of them because the 22 is leading and he starts falling through the field or what seemed like he was going to fall much further, but he was battling the heck out of people as this mm-hmm. was going on. So if we're talking about trying to find little glimpses of hope or little glimpses of entertainment, um, that was it. But I think, I don't know if it was that, if it was this, it was this the first stage or was this the second stage? Was the second That's stage? the end of the second, that was the end of the second stage. Cause one of the, one of the, the one point you'd sent me a, an eloquent text message that said something was like watching paint dry. <laughs> and, and I said, I think at that time I was like, well, watching Ryan at least was kind of exciting. Like he yeah. moved up five spots, but that, that was about it. But yeah, it's like yeah. these little spurts where I was entertained, but, and we will probably continue to talk about it, but it's like, maybe it wasn't for really the right reasons. It was real situational and, and because mm-hmm. of weird strategies or, or not necessarily because, you know, guys were able to run up on people and move them out of the way and race. So. This, this, uh, you know, maybe we talk about more at the end, but this is one of those things about watching on TV versus watching it live. 
But for our perspective, we're watching one, you know, one person as best we can too. And he's one of the few people of the 30 some out there. He's one of the few that actually has a car that can do stuff. And I think that's what makes it exciting for us. I don't know about Very TV. True. I haven't, I haven't even watched the TV coverage of it yet. Um, probably watch it in the next day or two. Uh, but I don't even know if TV can cover that or show that or how they do that, you know? So, uh, but here's the fun part. We do the two tire change, right? So we saw what the 22 did. I think the call was blue from what I understand on the radio. Um, and they go ahead and they just say something. And Ryan says, yeah, it sounds like a good idea at this point. You know, got to try and do something. And they go from 20th to eighth with this two tire change. Uh, and once again, the 54 and the 99 take two tires here too. Once again, though, I don't think their car was as good as the 12 car because, you know, look what the 12 car starts to do here. Um, we restart lap 193. Um, lap 194 is in ninth. Uh, lap 202, we get a caution for the 20 uh, at this point. Uh, pretty much none of the leaders pit here. We restart lap 209 from ninth. Um, we get back to 11th here within a couple laps. At lap 248, get up to 10th. At uh, lap 295, here's the green flag pit stops. Now, this cycle takes a long time. As some guys gamble, you lose two laps on a green flag pit stop at Martinsville, pretty much. And um, the tire wear, it was not enough where it was like a two second or, you know, a difference on, you know, fresh tires or anything like that. So, um, you know, pitting a little earlier than somebody else kind of works, but it doesn't necessarily always work. And then, like I said, trying to pass you know, unless you're way faster. And, and like I said, they weren't that much faster, you know, but by um, lap 297, Ryan does come in. They do a 10.36 stop, which is really good for a green flag cycle. Um, by lap 328, so almost third, well, over 30 laps later, not everybody had pitted yet still. <laughs> you know, some of the guys are hanging on, hanging on, hoping they catch a caution, trap a bunch, a bunch of guys down. Um, he's up to 10th at this point. Lap 330 up to ninth, lap 332 up to eighth. Now, some of the passing he does do here is amazing. He actually goes and passes on the outside. Just like Once the fall. I don't know. Just yeah, like I don't fall. know. I don't know if the TV shows this or not, but it and it takes a lap or two. You don't just pass like right in one corner. You know, you set it up down the back stretch, three and four, you get start to get it. You know, you come down the front stretch, you get a little closer. Sometimes it takes a whole two laps to get finally complete that pass. Um, but he does a couple of these and at lap 336, 337 there, he goes from eighth to sixth. And then uh, lap 346, he gets to fifth. Um, and, and he's chasing, um, he starts chasing the 11 car. And what's great about this, this is um, some situational awareness by the two car. <laughs> <laughs> Actually starts to happen. Um, he gets uh the two cars in front of the 11, the two car is a lap down and he almost looks like he's trying to throw a pick. Yep. Uh, it's hard to figure out because there's a lap, lap car that gets in the way once in there, but Ryan is trying to get to, if he gets a pick, can he get around him on the outside? Um, can he get underneath the 11? Um, what finally ends up happening is the two ends up out in front of the, in front of the 11, they get all spread out again. Yeah. Um, spread out like a half a second behind each other and Ryan River really, really can get back to the 11. They have all running the same lap times again. And, uh, the two car actually holds to his position there. I mean, he's still lap down, but he runs between the three third place car and the fourth place car for the next bunch of laps, you know? Um, and <laughs> it almost worked. There was a point yeah. where Ryan got got to side by side with the eleven and the, like the two. I mean, the two did just want to completely park it. I'm assuming, and this may have just been coincidental, but um, I thought it was going to work. But Denny kept changing lanes, and I, that basically slowed Ryan's momentum. And then that was pretty much it. But yeah. I thought there was a point when, yeah, I mean, I, I'm like, you know, because I feel like every once in a while the two is like trying to to make up yeah. for past transgressions, like he did yeah. last week. Honestly, I mean, the rest of the race last week after the issue they had um you know he was pulling over getting out of the way as much as he possibly could but 
Um, what are you going to do? He, I, I said like, well, he tried. It, it was nice. I mean, I was, I was a little sad at that point because the way Ryan was marching through the field, he was basically on the same straightaway as the leader. And I was like, mm-hmm. this is possible. And there was like 40 yeah. something laps left. And I'm like, he could actually pull this off, but it all completely stalled racing the 11. And then that was pretty much it until yeah. one last glimmer of hope. So, yeah. So we get this caution for, um, at lap, uh, I got 397, and it's for the 42 car on fire. And so we're going to get a green white checker. I don't know what happened to the 42 car, but it literally was on fire, and they dragged it, dragged it over to Fit Road. Um, everybody loved it. Out. I yeah, think the crowd crowd, crowd went. Oh, well, <laughs> sure, because it finally <laughs> gave us something. Won, that, yeah, yeah, we knew we we're going to. Okay, so now we know we're not spread out. Now we know we're not yeah. going to be running the same exact lap times. Now we're going to know we're going to get beaten and banging at the end. Now, um. Everybody should have been staying out. I don't understand. So first off, Ryan uh, makes it look like he's going to go behind Denny, and then he backs out the last second, yeah. and Denny hits pit road. And I didn't read any post race. Did Denny need to hit pit road? Was his tires that bad? No, it was. I think Chris Gabart said he made it an emotional decision um, to bring him in. And I'll tell you this: you know, I we're listening to the MRN broadcast, and Todd Gordon's on many of the MRN races as like their crew chief analyst and Todd, the whole caution said, you got to at least come and get two. you got to at least come and get two, two tires. I just can't see leaving anybody out there with, with no tires. Like he really thought, you know, what Denny did was going to potentially win him the race. And uh, so it was one of those situations where, I mean, Todd obviously won several races with Todd. Don't want to necessarily say anything bad about him, but there were a couple two or three times where Todd made decisions on a, on a last pit stop where Ryan was in contention for a win that didn't work out. So, um, yeah, but so. he's also, he also made great decisions that, that led to victories too, but that's all I could think about is like, and I'm like, I don't know, but that's how Todd was. He was, he was kind of really risk averse. And, um, but it, it's, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately well, for Denny, um, he here, actually had some here's, losing spot, but <laughs> here, yeah, here's here. Yeah. He, you know, he probably would have finished in the top five and, uh, here's the thing, like you get 20, I don't know if there are about 20 cars left on the lead lap at this point, roughly. Let's say the first four guys, let's say in front of Ryan, all 14. Fit. I think it was 14 cars, by the way. 14 cars uh, in the last lap? Yeah. Okay, I thought there was a little more. I guess not. Um, so 14 cars on the lead lap. So let's say the first four pit, I'm staying out if I'm Ryan in fifth, because you know how many guys behind me are going to stay out? Almost all of them. And I think that's why you had to stay out. I think that the lead guys all figured it out. It's like, if we stay, if we come in right now, those guys are going to be staying out and it's only two laps. It's not enough time. Two laps on a mile and a half track. You might be able to make up the ground because the tire, uh, you know, the tires will be two, three seconds faster and you're starting less than that from behind somebody. But when your tires are that much faster and you're only running these short little two laps yeah you got to stay out so staying out was a great decision um problem is ryan start, starting from fourth and he even says it in a post-race interview too that fourth is just not a position you're going to be able to get to the yep. front from um we got the 24 taking the inside then the nine takes the front row outside the five takes the the bottom inside and then ryan ends up on the top outside and it, like I said, it, it ends up being a, you know, the green, white checkered here the, on the white flag lap. Um, well, actually the lap before on the first lap, there's a crash down in, uh, uh, three and four and they don't call nothing. And I guess it yeah. didn't end up on TV. They were saying no, it didn't and, end up on TV. I didn't really I even like, see it either. It was, so I don't know if they got going real fast, but I've seen did, the replay did. since, but yeah, I've seen a replay of Cindric was in the middle of it. Somebody ruined Cindric's day. Um, and it was from two cars behind him. It wasn't even. The guy right behind him, it was two cars behind him. It got hit into him in an accordion uh, uh, out. And um, then, like I said, the next lap on the white flag lap, going into one and two, Ryan is really pushing the nine hard on the outside. And Chase got loose, really loose. And Ryan more or less had to back off because he didn't want to be like the next man in, just piling into him and, and lose a position. And actually, he kind of did lose a position. He went from fourth to fifth by the end of the race. Um, but you know, uh, the 24 wins, but Ryan with a great top five considering where the, where the day started and how fast they were. Uh, they showed how fast they were. They got themselves back up to fifth. So 
uh, kudos to them. And, uh, you know, of course, they had the whole Hendrick thing, uh, you know, where they're all up there. And uh, Bubba Wallace with a great fourth place finish, too. Yeah, I mean, Bubba is having a career start to a year. I, I would say a career year. I don't know. I don't know how to say it, but multiple top fives. And, and kudos to him. I mean, he ran up front all day, and he raced Ryan hard on um, the, after that green flag cycle when Brian got past him. But, man, there was a real glimmer of hope there when um, the 9 and – the 24 kind of ran up the track on that uh, green white checker restart. And I thought there's a chance Ryan could maybe cut down across if those two would have just made more contact. But then, yeah, Mm -hmm. after that, it was really, you know, Ryan was kind of stuck where he was maybe one last effort to push the nine, like into the, into the corner. But um, yeah, so the unfortunate, but this is one of those races where, you know, we would talk about this all season last year that said, you know championship winning teams face adversity like this and they come out with good finishes and they did Mm -hmm. it all last year and what did it result in it resulted in a championship um they face adversity here they have what i would say is their first pit road issue major pit road issue all year long on the pit crew i think ryan's been caught Mm -hmm. speeding once or twice this year um, but this is really the first one where they've had to come back down. And honestly, even all last year, I mean, the 22 and the two had lots of loose wheels. I can't really remember a time when maybe one all of last season. So a loose wheel for the 12 crew is really um, rare. So unfortunate that it happened. But fortunately, Jonathan from the pit box made one uh, great you know, changes to this car to get it back into contention where Ryan could be one of the few cars that could actually pass um, mm-hmm. and two great strategy calls at the right moments to, to get him back to the front. And once again, you know, Ryan had an average finish of ninth at this track over his career. Um, I forget what this is. It's, it's like the fourth or fifth time he's finished in the, at least the top 10, but the last several have all been top fives, including that, that victory in the fall race. So um, best track, Showed up once again. Maybe if he had a tiny bit more track position, I don't know. But the Hendrick cars were super, super fast, and it just seemed like they were destined to win on there. If you were at the track, you definitely knew that it was Hendrick's 40th anniversary because it almost I made a joke to somebody that it was seemed like it was the Hendrick Motorsports 400 at Hendrick Motorsports Speedway <laughs> because they had they had show cars yeah. everywhere, they had banners everywhere. 15, there was 1,500 people, 15, right? People, yeah, employees. So in red shirts, um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I want a couple things. I want to I want to definitely go back to talk about Jonathan for a second and the unheralded things that happen. You know, the two the two tire call first off. Um, you know, seeing what the twenty two was able to do with it, realizing his driver can can do with it. And the thing is, is when you make a two tire stop, you make adjustments to the car too accordingly to make sure that you can run on two tires and not lose ground. And they never did lose any ground with it, really. And then the pit call during the green flat cycle coming in when they did, and then whatever adjustments they made during that were excellent because from that point forward you know ryan gains position or two on the track um on the stop itself but he also ends up passing two or three cars on the track and two or three don't sound a lot but it went from eighth to fifth um and he passed them on the outside so the adjustments that jonathan made during those 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 two things were extremely good and put them in position to to get the finish they got um you know, which, well, like I said, boy, the way the race started wasn't, you know, didn't look like it was going to be like that. So, you know, let's give Jonathan a lot of credit, too, for making sure that Ryan had something he could work with uh, as the race went on. Um, the other thing is, is like, again, well, I don't know what TV coverage looks like of this. Uh, we're there live. I listened to uh, the teardown. Literally, we listened to it as they do it live on YouTube Sunday night uh, while we were driving a little bit. And you know, he got, Jeff went on a rant and he said today that he was kind of embarrassed that he did this. And I told him nothing to be embarrassed about. You know, I said on X that there's nothing to be embarrassed about because the truth is, is they were supposed to have made some changes for the short check program and it didn't happen. I mean, it, they made the changes, but it didn't work. It didn't do anything different. Um, the cars are still running almost the same exact lap times within a tenth. And when you don't have them where there's a little bit of a variance, you can't make a good pass. Now, some of the other things the car used to be able to do is you used to be able to get up underneath somebody and wiggle them a little bit. The old bump and run, 
Um, these cars, when they hit, they kind of bounce off each other. They're so rigid that many times I saw, you know, whether it was Ryan or somebody else, literally just bounce off the nose and just move forward a little bit coming off a turn. Austin Cindric would be a great example of this when he was battling with Denny Hamlin and staying in front, trying to stay up in front of Hamlin. Um, you know, he's a lapper and really he, you know, some of the lappers when they knew they were just like a lot slower or whatever, or thought we knew they were out of it a little bit, they let guys by. Um, Austin decides to race him because Austin's running almost the same exact lap, lap times. And Denny hit him a number of times during this. And it did not get the car out of shape where Denny could have took advantage of it. And that says a lot about the car and the way it's designed. The older cars, you know, you might have crumpled a fender or the back end would have wiggled, you know, when you got hit from behind a certain way and you would have lost a little bit, not enough to wreck, but enough to a little bit to where you got a little loose and all of a sudden the guy got underneath you by the next turn and then that was it. It was over. Um, so, you know, you know they, they say tire wear would probably help with, with a lot of this, you know, because that's what, what happened with Bristol. It changed, changed the game at Bristol with the tire wear um, because then you just saw guys who were better at conserving their tires. But we don't have a car, you know, except for a couple cars. And the 24 car is one of them this past race where they really hit on something and were able to pass people. The 24 was one of those. He, because he didn't start at the front of the field either. Um, and he found his way to the front by being able to pass some people. Ryan was another one, another hundred laps to this race. If this is a 500 lap race and Ryan yeah. <laughs> would probably be running within the, you know, he was running top five, but he probably would have gotten near the leader. You know, he was better in passing the guys with traffic and so forth too. So, um, but there was only two or three cars like that out there. You know, and once they got out there and they got spread out you know, after the you know initial restarts, and there weren't a, and there weren't a lot of restarts either because we didn't have a lot of natural cautions. We didn't have one of those races. We had eight cautions or nine cautions. It was it was paint watching paint dry. You know, we're watching a guy who's actually making a couple passes. Now, like I said, I don't know if TV's even showing. Like you said before, the guys running twenty fourth and twenty fifth are battling pretty hard, but they're not really going anywhere. <laughs> They were going one behind the other, and maybe he could get to his outside, or maybe he got underneath them a little bit. And for three or four laps, he was underneath them, and then his tires wore out enough, and his stuff wore out enough, and he couldn't get make finish the pass. So that's that was just what we were watching, and uh, that was there live watching it. it just just it was not a great show, <laughs> um, and I don't know if the drivers like that or not. I don't. It doesn't really sound like they do, but uh, there's something that needs to be different. Um, and they, like I said, they're supposed to make this adjustment to the short track, a short package, a short track package, but didn't look like there was any real adjustment. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those situations and you're right. The bump and run is mostly gone with this car. That's basically they're down to like a dive bomb. Like you, you really have to get to the inside of somebody and instead of a bump and run, it's, you're more like pushing them up the track and then getting a better drive off. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's unfortunate. The other thing that I'll say every single time is the shifting. There's just no, um, you know, nothing happens to you if you blow a corner now, because you could just grab a gear and take off and not really lose any time. So that's unfortunate. I did think, I mean, now we might have some rose colored glasses from the fall race because of what happened, but some mm-hmm. things did happen in the fall race and, and it was hot for one, you know, it was, it wasn't as cold as it was Saturday, but on Sunday it was in, you know, sixties, mid sixties, I think. So it was relatively warm sun beating down on the track, but it wasn't as warm as it was actually there when we were there in the fall, which is odd because it, it was a fall race, but it was still relatively warm in, in Virginia. The tire at that point, which was the same tire they brought back this time, laid down a lot more rubber. Now, I remember, I think, like Denny and some other people saying, like, yeah, it did lay down a lot a lot more rubber. But once the track kind of rubbered in, it just filled in all the pores. And then it, it didn't really mean that much after that. Um, I do think the outside groove came in much better in the fall than it did uh, in this race. And I think, again, that has to do with temperature. So there was like small glimmers of hope. But yeah, hundred percent right. I mean, making air, these aerodynamic changes to the car that they've been trying to do, and not messing with the engine, and not messing with the gearing to get them to stop shifting, not messing with the tire compounds. Really, I mean, they tried. They they brought that that tire in the fall that did better than it did in the spring race last year, which I believe the spring race last year was really bad. So 
um and then especially the first the first year the 2022 year of the next gen car too those those races at martinsville were not good as well so um i did think the fall race last year was much better than this one um, but in person i'm always going to say like for the most part i enjoy almost every race i go to in person like i said you mentioned me talking about cars in the back like cars in the back were battling they were smacking the heck out of each other they were driving each other up the track to make passes um, we definitely did get to see Ryan make a lot of passes. So that's when I always say like, Oh, you know, these guys will come out of their cars and say it was impossible to pass. I mean, Ryan has said that in a post-race interview, it's impossible to pass in a race where we've saw him pass, you know, more cars than anybody else on track. So I don't know if they'll ever stop saying that, but it's true. I mean, it's different. Dale jr. Last week in his show is really concerned because he loves Richmond. And, you know, Jordan Bianchi and some other reporters are pointing to the fact that Richmond is most likely going to lose its date next year. And it's not because of the tracks. It's because just this car is not suited for them right now. And um, I think the teardown, I think Jeff had said, like, this needs to be, you know, priority number one. Um, they should be putting everybody on this, trying to figure it out. Um, I don't know. I mean, I didn't haven't listened to Denny's podcast yet. I don't know if he'll talk about um he had a lot more things to talk about this week that might take up his time on his show more than just the racing but um will they talk about the engine again will they talk about tires todd gordon i mentioned him a little bit earlier todd gordon said if they could just figure out a way to maybe make the tire width different um but that kind of sounds like as far as the car goes they specifically designed the car to have the wheels and tires size that they have they would have to make a lot of changes to make that happen because the main thing is that these tires are so big and wide, they have a huge contact patch on the track that gives them so much grip. Um, so I, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a race, you know, expert. I have no idea how to fix it. All I know is they got to do something. Um, I just, I don't know what it is. They don't seem like they know what it is. I feel like that at some point they just need to go out there and bring a car and just do what everyone keeps saying, put it, you know, the most horsepower they could possibly, you know, put in if they had to do it, change the gear to where there's, they've stopped shifting and have Goodyear bring the softest tires they possibly can, or just several and, and see what happens. And they honestly would have to do that with a lot of cars. Cause if you bring two mm -hmm. or three out there, it's not going to mean much. So it's just wholesale changes and they don't want to do it. They brought the next gen car in, in theory that after several years, um, it will be cheaper to enter the sport. You won't have to do all this, you know, extra engineering and manufacturing on your own. It's basically a kit car you put together and everything else comes down to adjustments the crew chief can make. So I just don't know. Uh, on the plus side, um, I'm going to be headed to a mile and a half this weekend where the racing has been <laughs> better. better so. <laughs> so, so that'll be Texas. But one last note on uh, Martinsville uh, point standings. Ryan does not gain or lose any spots. He stays in the fifth position in the point standings. 48 points back of the new current points leader, uh, which is Kyle Larson, who supplants Martin Truex Jr. So top 10 is as follows. Larson in first, Truex in second, Hamlin's third. William Byron jumps up three spots after that win into the fourth position. Blaney is fifth, Chase Elliott sixth, Ty Gibbs falls a little bit to seventh. Ross Chastain is eighth, Ty Tyler Reddick moves up to ninth and Alex Bowman moves into the top 10. So from first to 10th, it's an 82 point difference there. And again, Blaney yeah. 48 points back. And Logano has popped up into the top uh, 16 now too. So, you know, just some nice consistent runs. Um, you know, ultimately you want the W so that you've locked yourself in, but right now it's just, just keep doing what you're doing, plugging away. These guys, uh, have been doing a good job of getting the you know getting the most out of bad situations and then you know this week was a really really good one this was a lot about adversity um, early on and how you respond to it and it's the character that they have now it's championship quality character we said it last year a lot and it proved to be true at the end of the season right now we're on that same kind of path you know um, just keep coming each week and keep doing your best and um, when you hit it all correctly during the week you'll you'll get that W. Now, last week, I was super excited to talk about the Team Blaney NASCAR Fantasy Live Week or League. Mm -hmm. This week, I yeah. can't say the same, but I know somebody else. Oh, come else on. Come on the, now. This should be exciting. Here that is. This is great. Come on. <laughs> you really want to talk about this. You know you do. So I'll go over my team first. Um, 
this was my, these are my, my starting lineup here. And I did make a change because of that great Wi-Fi um, that maybe I think it, it didn't end up working out because uh, I had Ryan, I think, in my starting lineup initially. I did move him to the garage after the early struggles that he had. So the starters I had in there, Chase Elliott got me 49 points. Alex Bowman got me 34 Josh Berry got me 15, Kyle Larson got me 53, and Martin Trex Jr. got me 25. So I think Berry, actually, there's points on the race where he was running up front, did not get that finish, though. Uh, so I left Ryan in the garage with 32 points. So I, I, if I could have, if I would have remembered properly, I probably would have swapped him back in for Barry. But um, I think that's right when things were heating up. So um, I was a little pre heating up as much as they could in a race you described as paint drying but um <laughs> so <laughs> that's where things stood there uh featured matchups i picked truex over hamlin wrong i picked blaney over byron wrong i picked no gregson over briscoe wrong uh, i picked logano over kyle bush uh that's the only one that i got correct so it was only one of four or yeah on that uh, featured matchups list so unfortunately for me after finishing the top 10 last week, I only could get to a 61st place finish this week from Martinsville in the Fantasy Live League. 186 total points. Um, you well outpaced uh, me and much of the, the field in the league. So let's yeah, hear what I, your um, magical starting lineup and featured matchups were. Yeah, this uh, was interesting because you mentioned that Ryan, you put in the garage, and due to the Wi-Fi, I was able to do the same thing. And and it was really weird because what I knew was I knew he, you know, he didn't have any stage points in the first stage, and I knew he wasn't going to have any stage points in the second stage, uh, coming to the close of that second stage. So I hurried up and made the move too. So Ryan ended up being in my garage, but my lineup ended up being Larson, Wallace, Logano, Hamlin, and Elliott, who ranked first, second, fifth, sixth, and third on points for the day. I was just missing whoever number four was there. Hamlin, actually Hamlin was going to be number four until he decided to pit. <laughs> he ends up finishing 11th on the day, uh, but he would have probably been one of the top five guys on the day and would have had a couple more points there. But hey, uh, in my matchups, I had Hamlin over Truex, and that was good. Um, I had Ryan over Byron. That's the one I missed. I had uh, Briscoe over Gregson, and I had Logano over Kyle Busch. Um, and this lineup ended up being a pretty good lineup. So let's take a look at the top 10 in points earned this past week at Martinsville Speedway in the Team Blaney NASCAR Fantasy Live League. In 10th, the Buckeye Bullet, 240 points. In 9th, Hawkeyes 07, 241. Dr. Race Chaser in 8th with 242. 7th is Zero Schlitz given 243. Joe Lopez won and Blaney's Daisy tied in 5th with 244 points. Uh, Charlie Abu. Uh, fourth, 248. JD Racing in third with 254. Blaniac 10 in second with 255. And your team, Mez 12, 265 points, 10 points over the second place finisher, wins the week at Martinsville. Congratulations. I uh, don't wish you luck in the future. Thanks. I think every <laughs> once in a while, one, I think every once in a while, one of the two of us should like put one in the top 10, right? Yeah. Uh, we, so. we talk about this enough. Once in a while, we ought to get lucky and hit one. Um, you know, that lineup was uh, basically a look at who was starting where. Um, I knew going into the race that this is one of those weeks. As long as people don't make huge mistakes, they're going to run pretty much where they're going to run. And when you look at all those points, it, you know, those were all guys. They all got stage points in the first two stages because they never really changed position much. And then they all stayed up near the front as the race went on because it never really changed position much. And I maxed out with it pretty much. Second kudos to my wife um, who asked me mm -hmm. while we were waiting in line to get into the track. Hey, did you set your fantasy lineup? Answer was no. Uh, um, so another kudos to again to NASCAR and Martinsville Speedway for their Wi-Fi because I could stand there in line waiting to to get into the track and make my not so great lineup, but it would have been much, much worse if I would have forgotten. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, my my wife beat you this week, too, just so you know. Anyway, overall standings in the Team Blading NASCAR Fantasy Live League. In 10th, Pocono Lady with 1,565 points. In 9th, Factory of Sadness 6, 1,569. In 8th, Montana 12 Fan, 1,576. In 7th is Go Larson, 1,592. 6 is Lissa C, 1,596. 5th is Frank Fan 12, 1,597. 
Dr. Race Chaser is holding down the fourth spot, 1,601. Blaney or Bust in third, 1,604. Penske Fan 24 is in second, 1,608. And pulling away from the field right now is Blaniac 10 in the first position, 1,641 points overall. Steve, you have moved up into the top 20 right now. You're in a tie for 19th, the three-way tie, 1,505 points. Um, it's just so crazy how close the points are right now that you could, I was bleeding you. We were both like in mm-hmm. the thirties last week. Uh, mm-hmm. You have a great week. You vault up into the top 20. I'm still in the thirties, 39th position. I feel like I just hover around here all season long, 1,431 points. And that brings us to this weekend's upcoming race. Short tracks are behind us for now. We're headed back to a mile and a half track out there in Fort Worth, Texas, Texas Motor Speedway. Action kicks off this Friday, April 12th, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You have the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series, speedycash.com 250. You can watch that race on FS1. Saturday, April 13th, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, NASCAR Cup Series practice and qualifying from Texas on FS1. So there you go, Steve, on FS1 this week. Yay. Uh, Saturday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the NASCAR Xfinity Series, Andy's Frozen Custard 300 at Texas. That's also on FS1. And then Sunday, you're going to want to tune in April 14th, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the NASCAR Cup Series Auto Trader, Echo Park Automotive 400 at Texas Motor Speedway, also on FS1. Let's take a look at Ryan Blaney's career statistics at Texas Motor Speedway, 15 total starts, four top fives, eight top tens, an average start of 9.9, an average finish of 16.3. He has had some trouble there over the years, four DNFs, and the one stat that's not on here, he did go to victory lane in the NASCAR Cup Series All-Star Race uh, just a couple of years ago, and that was the first race victory together with New Creve Chief Jonathan Hassler at the time. But it wasn't a points paying race. Um, like a lot of Ryan Blaney victories, it came with a ton of drama <laughs> in the fact that he had thought he had crossed the finish line, but a caution flag came out simultaneously. He dropped the window net, um, does some magic to get it to kind of stick back up there. NASCAR turns a blind eye, it falls down on the backstretch on the last lap, and he wins the race. But hey, um, turned into an amazing memory for us for multiple reasons. Um, but it is a, a victory that he has there. I believe he also has an Xfinity Series win at Texas. Um, pretty good track for him. Uh, 16.3 average finish. So uh, it's not like Martinsville statistics, but it's not too bad. And last several races there, except for this one in 2023, dating back to 2019, 8th, 7th, 4th, 6th, 4th. 2023 race, 28th. He was involved in a crash. I don't remember the details of it exactly, but he was involved in an accident. Um, he almost went, it looks like um, about nine, eight or nine laps down after the accident. So um, unfortunate for that, but he was on a top 10 streak there. One, two, three, four, five straight top tens up until this race in 2023. So um, what do you think the prospects are here? You know, back to a mile and a half track, um, Racing hopefully will be better, though Texas is a little bit weird because that's another one of those places that was reconfigured and people aren't necessarily excited about it. But I do think the next-gen car has at least brought it back up to being a little bit more tolerable than it was with the previous generation car after they they repaved and reconfigured. Yeah, I mean, we haven't had a lot of mile and a half so far yet this year. So, I well, Vegas, I think, was, was the only thing we've run so far. So, And Vegas, isn't like you said, is not comparable um so it's a matter of like watching practice and qualifying and just kind of like getting a grip on you know but so far this year like they said the mile and a half that they did run um they showed up pretty good at so they finished third at vegas and and then joey actually i think had the pole pole at vegas so you know we'll see you know from practice early on um how this is going to be once again once again when they get the single lap thing in practice here uh it's a little bit more a little more indicative only because they do kind of get spread out right away when they run their initial lap or two, when they, when the tires are are fresh. Um, But like I said, we want to see lap averages uh, because uh, just like the, the the race, the mile and a half race earlier this year, Ryan didn't start the race um, in the top 10. I think he started like 14th or 15th and ends up finishing third. So 
what are the lap averages look like for Ryan and, and the Penske guys? Um, and that'll kind of tell you early on, at least, what they're going to be able to do as far as moving up through the field. And then uh, during the race, what kind of adjustments happen? Do we keep up with the, how to keep up with the track? And we know that, that like I said, we know Jonathan's extremely good at doing that. Uh, so hopefully it's a good weekend overall. Uh, it should be. Let's put it that way. Yeah, worth mentioning too that this race is now in the spring. Last the last couple of years, it was held in September and was part of the playoffs. So this is the first year, I believe, where it's out of the playoffs. I believe it was boiling hot too. That was another reason why they moved this this date up to the spring. I don't know what the weather is going to be like yet this weekend. I know they they had spring races in the past before they lost their extra date. That has had some weather implications. Uh, gosh, I think there was one that went all the way to like Wednesday because of a, a misting situation. Um, so, so we'll have to see. The weather conditions will be different than they were there uh, this past September. Let's take a look at the last several winners there, and I'll go back until the to the 2019 season. I remember there was a time when Texas had multiple uh, races in one year. Um, Hamlin, Harvick, Dylan, Kyle Busch, Kyle Larson, Tyler Reddick. And William Byron, those are the last several winners there at Texas, and that doesn't include Ryan Blaney's all-star victory. Um, anybody, especially, you know, we're thinking about Team Blaney NASCAR Fantasy Live League, and I apparently need all the help I can get. Um, anybody from that list, I mean, the Larsons, I think Larson and Byron, I mean, I don't know, you can't, buy, William Byron's winning on every possible type of racetrack, so um, I say use the 24 car in your fantasy lineup as much as possible. Mm -hmm. He hasn't, he hasn't had yeah. a super consistent year though. He has these three victories, but he also has multiple finishes, I think outside the top 20. So, um, but Hey, see, see what he looks like in practice, but I don't, you can't really bet against the 24 Kyle Larson great at Texas. I think most of the time, uh, Tyler Reddick, um, he, he won the race in 2022, but I think that would have been with uh, Richard Childress racing still. So different team. Now he's with 2311. Um, Kyle Bush, man, I don't, I don't know. I, I know yeah, the RCR team came out hot last year, but they are having some big time struggles uh, this year. So I don't think he's necessarily going to be on my lineup. So outside of waiting to see practice, um, anybody else that you think might have an opportunity this weekend? Uh, you know, the nine car, you know, anything Hendrick pretty much uh, the nine car, you know, the 48 is, I don't know if he's at a point now where he's going to try too hard, but 48 had speed at, you know, at last weekend too. So Ada Hendrick, obviously uh, the 2311 guys are great at, at putting together a car for, for a mile and a half. So uh, Bubba and, uh, and Reddick should be pretty good too. And then once again, all your Gibbs cars, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm, let me just pick half the field. Right. Um, so it just, it's just so tough right now because um, you know, till you get to the actual race condition, and whether or not mistakes are made, you know, and that's where it is. You got to run a perfect race and uh, try not to make mistakes and not try not to have a, any adversity because there's 30 some other guys that are trying to do the same thing. So doesn't that tell you something just the way you're, you're talking? Um, you know, we can get disappointed sometimes when Ryan, you know, finishes 11th or 12th or something like that. There's so many elite teams out there, though. It's really hard to finish in the top 10 in the NASCAR cup series. And I think maybe that's something when you're, you're used to rooting for a team like the 12 team that has had a lot of success the last several years. Like you forget about that, that it's, this is not an easy thing to do. And there are a lot of really well-funded teams that finish, you know, first through 20th or, you know, 10th through or 11th through 20th, I should say every week. Yeah. You know, take the two, take the, the two four car teams, the, the, the Gibbs and the Hendrick. Okay. And, look at them and you go, okay, usually one guy, if not two guys within a four car team end up excelling. Right. But week in, week out, it's three of the four, not always the same three either, but three of the four. So that's six spots right there. Usually in the top 10 before you go to any other team and Ford per se, you know, right now, Ryan's the best Ford guy out there. Um, and then, then maybe Joey, and then, you know, we're not going to get a lot of Fords from, uh, from uh, Haas really very often. But that's the thing is you're looking at two teams filling about six of the, of the eight top tens right off the bat. And it's just it's tough, extremely tough uh, just to get to the top ten. 
So again, if you want to tune in to see Ryan Blaney on track this weekend, you can watch him Saturday morning, 1030 a.m. 10 Eastern time for NASCAR Cup Series practice and qualifying from Texas on FS1. Then Sunday, April 14th, 3.30 p.m. Eastern time for the NASCAR Cup Series Auto Trader Echo Park Automotive 400 at Texas, also on FS1. And wanted to throw a shout out to David Elam. Um, he listens to the show, I think, every week, follows us on social media. He's a fan that dates back to the Dave Blaney fan uh, times, the fan era. And uh, I know he's uh, mentioned a few times that he's going to be out there at Texas this weekend and looking to uh, meet some fellow Blaney fans out there. So I uh, hope, David, hope you have a great uh, race weekend. hope you have, uh, you're able to cheer Ryan Blaney on to a victory uh, this week in Fort Worth. But Steve, um, do you want to do an official announcement that came out this past week of the Ryan Blaney Family Foundation uh, event in Iowa coming up? Uh, that's Father's Day weekend, correct? Yeah, I'll have to look up June, the exact June uh, stats there. Hang on. But it's an amazing event. Um, um, uh, Leah had um, had given us a uh, heads up on the podcast. She didn't have the, uh, the details of the event at that point, um, but they're doing... Um, it's called Dinner with the, the Champions. There, there you go. Thank you. And it is uh, beginning of June here, June 15th, uh, Saturday night, the night before the Iowa NASCAR race. Uh, Dave, Dale, and Ryan. Um, I think it was how much per ticket was it? A hundred uh hundred dollars per person. It says you can mm-hmm. enjoy a dinner buffet and a meet and greet with Ryan, Dave, and Dale. Plus, you'll be able to watch the World of Outlaws race from the national sprint car hall of fame um i wish this was something that i could get to if you get to it if anybody yeah. else get to it i'm extremely uh, jealous one i love the world of outlaws so you're going to get to see a world of outlaws race from the vantage point of the national sprint car hall of fame um you get to meet and greet with the three blaney drivers there two of those drivers are in the national have been inducted into the national sprint car hall of fame grandfather lou also a member of the National Sprint Car Hall of Fame. Um, so to me, this seems like an incredible value, $100, but you get this meet and greet, you get dinner, you get to watch you know, a World of Outlaws race, which I can tell you those tickets aren't uh, necessarily cheap as well. So um, this is an amazing opportunity, in my opinion, uh, to help support the Ryan Blaney Family Foundation. And if you're already going to be out that way for the Iowa Cup race, um, that's going to be within the, you know, the few days there. Um, swing over to uh, Knoxville and check this Knoxville. out. Yeah, so I just I just want to bring that up because we, like I said, we talked about it on when we had Leah on the show uh, a couple weeks back, but she did not have all the details at that point, and uh, they did put that out this past week. So uh, go to their social media pages. Um, once in a while, we'll retweet it or whatnot. Um, but uh, go ahead and you know get in on that if you can too, because uh, that should be a great show. Yeah, for ticket information and and anything else, it's Iowa dot cbo dot io for details and tickets and that's a great way to to meet the blaney's there uh enjoy dinner enjoy a great race all from the national sprint car hall of fame at knoxville and uh support the foundation yeah also um you know they put it up again today that they're going to have the wall of fame at the uh at the pickleball uh thing uh, 25 dollars gets you your card on the wall of fame with your name on it uh, but for 50 uh, dollar donation. Ryan will autograph the card and they'll mail it to you. And that's at rbffpickleball.cbo.io. Um, so uh, once again, that's something cool. We always make sure we do get uh, get uh, our name on that wall there. Kind of shows uh, if you can't be at the event, it's a nice way of being able to donate to the event. Uh, so make sure you check that out. Uh, like I said, Ryan Billion Family Foundation uh, put that on their X and their Facebook, uh, but it's rbff pickleball.cbo.io for all that information. So thank you everyone once again for tuning in to this episode of the Team Blaney podcast. You can interact with us on Facebook and X at Team Blaney and on Instagram at and TikTok at team.blaney. We'd also like to encourage you to support the aforementioned Ryan Blaney Family Foundation. Ryan's official charitable organization benefits brain health causes like UPMC Sports Medicine and the Alzheimer's Association. To learn more, visit RyanBlaneyFamilyFoundation.org or follow them on Facebook, X, and Instagram. So for my co-host Steve Mez, I'm Adam Rogers. We'll catch you next time here on the Team Blaney Podcast. Good night, Brussels and Netherlands. Check out the TikTok. 
Well, thanks everybody for coming. I hope you enjoyed it.